All right, <laughs> we're ready to roll. I'm very excited about this panel. Uh, and uh, uh, the way we're gonna do it is, uh, I'm, each person is gonna talk for 10 or 15 minutes and we're gonna go through that without any questions or comments immediately. So take notes or remember questions that you wanna have. And that if, 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 our, if our speakers stay on time, uh, which is partly my job too, uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And, and that might be the most fun part of this whole thing. So uh, we're gonna start with Kelly Wolford, who is an active participant in the African-American Health Equity Task Force, which you just heard about. And she has interest in, in mental health. She has a long history of working in the community. She's founder and principal of Front Seat Life LLC, dedicated to eliminating stigma of addressing mental health and with a focus in particular on communities of color. She's the inaugural director of the uh, Health Equity Office in of the Erie County Department of Health, as I just told you about. And I have to say, the last thing I'll say, Kelly, and, and then you can go, is I heard Kelly talk about health literacy uh, and using plain language from the community point of view in an episode of the Buffalo show, uh, uh, the, the, the radio show, Buffalo, What's Next? And when I heard that, I said, Kelly's got to be on this panel. So Kelly, welcome. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when I came in, there were some more people sitting over there. And I, I came in and sat over there. And I'm like, wow, this could be a great joke about the smart people sitting in the front of the class. But then I didn't want to offend anybody if they were sitting in the back and they're actually the smartest in the room. So everyone is, is smart and intelligent and incredible and whole. Um, so I have 15, 10 or so minutes to uh, talk about um, health literacy and the social determinants of health. Um, just a quick uh, summary of those, if you're unfamiliar with the social determinants of health. They're uh, the drivers of health outcomes, where people live, where they work, where they play, where they worship, where they learn, um, the systems around all those things um, either increase or narrow the options that someone has in their life to be healthy. And so when it comes to health literacy on its surface, you know, it's... Um, it seems like it's a, a easy fix, right? Like we'll just, we'll use plain language. But what does that mean? When, um, it, uh, is everyone here um, a researcher or medical professional? Anyone not one of those two things? So everyone here is a researcher or a medical professional? Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. So anyone ever uh, do work outside of medicine or research? Okay, cool beans. All right, so the, the, the type of language that you use in that other job, right, is, is not the same type of language that you use in, in this job. Uh, anybody have any family or friends? <laughs> awesome. We don't have the same conversation and use the same language with our I don't. Let me just, I do not use the same language with my family and friends that I would necessarily use in the room of medical professionals and researchers. And so when it comes to what plain language actually looks like, one of the things that we did at the Office of Health Equity was we created a newsletter, kind of midstream approach to social determinants of health. Uh, my goal is to break the system and rebuild it. That takes time. Uh, and in the meantime, I, I still want people to be able to navigate the system. And so that's what the newsletter does. It, it allows people that may not know or understand the systems to navigate them while we're also in the process of breaking them down and building them back up. We knew right away that we needed to translate the newsletters, um, understanding that, again, we, we are required by law um, to meet people where they are. And so outside my personal desire to do so, that is the mandate of the office. And we uh, went to translate our first newsletter. And 
the words were technically able to be translated, but everything was lost in the sauce, right? Like it didn't make sense. It really came to a head when we did the uh, working in government newsletter. We wanted to write about the civil service process. Um, civil service, it, the way that it works is unique to the US um, and, and how ours works in Erie County is unique to Erie County and it's different than how it works for the city of Buffalo civil service. And so we had to figure out how do we use plain language? How do we create a newsletter that translates into Spanish and Burmese and Arabic and Swahili and Bengali um, so that we're only writing the newsletter one time, right? Tends to upload it all resources. It would be great if we write five different newsletters every single month about the system. And so we had to translate civil service. It doesn't translate. So how do you begin to increase diversity and build a culture of inclusion in a, a primarily um, white dominant society and culture? I'm just talking about Erie County, the government. Um, when you, the words don't translate. And so we had to strip away the idioms. We had to, to strip away um, what we would talk about around the table. Um, we had to strip away words like social determinants of health. There's a lot of people that talk about and understand what they are now, but our everyday uh, community members whose life is not focused on health equity, they understand the social determinants of health because they're living them, right? But to use those words is kind of lost in the sauce. And so what we decided to do uh, was sit around the table, all many of our, our staff members, and figure out how we can come up with words that made sense. What does civil service actually mean? It means working in government, right? That was not the first, that, that was the, the final uh, uh, term that we came up with, but it wasn't the second or third. We had to do that throughout the newsletter. But then we realized that we would be doing a disservice to people because when it comes to working in government, and I'm going to bring this back to medicine, uh, when it comes to working for government, all of these civil service exams, and so you have to take an exam in order to keep your job, which is a whole other like, lecture series, uh, you have to take this exam, and the exam is only available in English. Are we doing a disservice to people by translating this newsletter into five different languages when the exam is only available in English? So now we've educated people on how to get a job in a place that they can't work at because they can't take the exam. So how do we do both? How do we um, reach people and at the same time keep it real about what life is really like, at least working for government? And so we decided to keep some of the words um, the same, like being reachable is it, not a word, but that is a civil service term. And you really can't describe, you, there, there's no translation to be reachable. We left those terms the same. We left terms on job postings that uh, don't translate well the same. One, because we still wanted to get the information out to people. Um, I may speak Arabic, and these may speak Arabic and English. I come across the Arabic translation, I read it, and least this is how you work in government. By reading that particular uh, newsletter, I, the first person reading it, am able to understand this may not be for me, but it can still help my community. And so when it comes to medicine and using plain language and using words that make sense, you know, I, I wanted to figure out, like, how do you make that translation from everyday language to, to research and medicine? And so I'm going through this um, medical situation. The people that know me know I don't usually walk with a cane. Uh, and it's been quite an experience. 
And so I was um, having this conversation with myself and I went to my EMR and read my medical record. That in and of itself when it comes to health literacy and social determinants of health and things. But I'm sitting there and I'm reading, you know, my MRI results, and I have a master's degree and half of a PhD. Um, I'm, I am highly educated. I am an expert in my field. And I came across a term that I didn't understand. And that term was trying to get wrong. It is posterior epidural lipotomasis, lipotomas. Um, for anyone that knows what that is, is that English or the Latin? I don't even know. I don't, I don't know, right? So when we're talking about translating, when we're talking about reaching people where they are, I can write a book and I don't know what language that is. We get caught in who we are and what we do. And sometimes we forget that we may be using plain language amongst ourselves, the, the lowest common denominator language amongst ourselves. But are we using the lowest common denominator language when it comes to outreach, when it comes to education, when it comes to research, when it comes to meeting with the patient? And so my doctor, I have a fantastic physician. She explained exactly what it was. Uh, but still reading those words, um, so I went to Google, dangerous. But my health literacy also includes technological health literacy. So I know what sites are good sites and what sites are, are not. Most people do not. If we look around us, read a newspaper article, we can tell people don't know where to get information from. And these folks have degrees. They're experts in their fields, right? And so I, I, I wonder, like, how do you have this conversation with someone who doesn't have a master's degree, who doesn't speak for a living, who is just out here doing the best they can with what they got? And my first uh, attempt at this was, you have a tumor on your spine, and it's not cancerous. We need to run additional tests. Does that sound similar to what you might hear in the doctor's office or researching? Let's see some head nodding. Okay. How do we know what a tumor is? Like we know, we know, but can we assume that our patients know, that our clients know, that our, our, our participants know and understand? And so what I came up with was much longer than posterior epidural lipomatosis. And this is my final iteration. So I'm imagining myself sitting with my doctor and she says this to me instead. So Kelly, the body is made up of different types of cells and they're really the building blocks for our body. There's skin cells, there's blood cells and bone cells, all kinds of different cells. Now they work together, but each one sticks to its own job, right? So the blood cells only do what the blood cells do. We got your test back, and your test showed that you have fat cells, which is just another type of cells, that are growing where they shouldn't be growing. That might be causing what's happening with you. And what I want to do is dig a little deeper. I want to find out more to see if we can figure out the source, the place where your issue is really coming from. Much longer. Then, you know, I can't say it, than, than the first one, right? But that's something, and I did use some slang in there, but, but that explanation is one that can be translated. It's one that can be understood whether you have an MD, a PhD, no D, like regardless of who you are, we're better able to understand and no matter how educated I am, that last sentence doesn't speak beneath me, right? It doesn't make me feel any less 
It doesn't make me feel like I don't know or that I should know more, right? We have to begin to change our everyday language. So our, our everyday in this space language, because I guarantee what you work on has words that you use that someone else who is also in medicine or someone else who's also a researcher had no clue what that means. But like most of us, we just smile and nod, like, yeah, that sounds like a great project. Hey, Google, what does uh, blah, 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 blah mean? Right? We can eliminate the misunderstandings even in our professional settings. So Tim knows I can talk for hours. I will pass the mic and hopefully we'll have some questions later on. Um, that is health uh, literacy and the social determinants of health. Thank you so much, Kelly. Our next speaker will be Veronica Meadows Ray. Veronica has participated in Roswell Park's Breast Cancer Survivor Program. She's also a member of the National Witness Project uh, and has worked with university researchers a lot. She's had a great partnership with Dr. Heather Oaks Balcom in the School of Public Health. Uh, they worked together on a study that led to the discovery of newly identified mutations associated with breast cancer. And according to Dr. Oaks Balcom, it was Veronica's questions that generated the whole study that led to the discovery of these of the of this new this, this new observation. And I'm happy to say that this is Veronica's second time presenting at the CPSI forum. She was here in 2018 as well. Uh, so she is a patient, a research participant, a researcher, uh, and a partner and colleague. So she brings a great perspective to this conversation. So Veronica, thank you for joining us. Well, um, I'm a breast cancer survivor from 2007. I had triple negative breast cancer. Um, so I'm getting to how is it that I got into this research thing. But triple negative breast cancer, I found my own love, like 50% of breast cancer patients, they find their own loves. Um, but it was the size of a quarter. I was considered um, stage three, stage four. So I jumped right into chemo right after that, had my surgery and did my radiation. But one of the things that the disparity department wanted me to do was to take a gene test for BRCA1 and 2. What you don't know is I'm one of nine breast cancer survivors in my family. So I thought it was a pretty ridiculous question that she needed me to take a gene test for breast cancer uh, because it was obvious I have the gene, but compared to me and nine other people in my family have it. But it turns out none of us had it. And um, so as I looked more into the BRCA1 and 2 gene research, I thought, well, maybe it was because it was a research project that was done in the 80s with predominantly white women. And so I thought to myself, well, even though we probably all come from one other country, maybe there's something in the African-American, Black, and African gene that might help with figuring out better ways to diagnose and treat breast cancer. So my thought was, well, why don't we research that? Well, it turned out that that turned out to be a pretty good idea. So that's how I got into research. I traveled the entire United States beginning in 2009 through 2012, trying to find other African-American families um, or African families that have multiple cases of blood-related breast cancer. Well, that's a pretty hard thing to do because in a, you know in a lot of families, if a person gets breast cancer, it may be the only person that gets breast cancer. It's not all the time, numerous blood-related relatives that get breast cancer. Well, I found out the hard way that 
I could break up recruitment success based right down the middle of the United States and right down the middle and across because it seemed like the regions, the Black people who lived in the regions responded differently to being involved in something that wasn't none of my business. Okay? Their health record was none of my business. And why would they want to give up their privacy to participate in something like recruiting or research? Why would I want to do that? And especially because African-American people have a bad history with research. You all know it. I don't need to go through it to keep you by the up. So you, what you find is that a lot of after I'm talking about recruiting from an African-American perspective. So with African-Americans in my own personal experience is it's very hard to get them to share information unless someone that they knew recommended it. So someone that they know, not just I met her and she said, but perhaps the pastor at their church, perhaps the women's group that they're in, perhaps um, when they went to their AKA sorority meeting, there was a, a health speaker there talking about research. Now you've got direct connections into people that are recommending that this might be okay, a research project that you might want to participate in. Another question that always comes up is, what's in it for me? I also found that African-Americans also wanted to know, well, what are you going to give me if I give you something? So we often gave out Wayman's cards, Hops cards, um, any kind of gift card, because that was some way that they felt that they were being paid if we weren't going to pay them money. The next thing is, um, I want to tell you that in the Northeast, the response I got was, that is so wonderful what you're doing. This is great, Veronica. Perfect. Can I get your, can I, can I get your blood sample? Can I get your saliva? Oh, no, 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 no. But what you're doing is great. No, but what you're doing is great. Southeast, all the African-American women. But could I get your blood? Can I get your saliva to be in this research? Sure, baby, come on, I'll give it all to you. Southeast was very easy. They wanted to participate. West Coast, academia. Okay, North, South, academia could not get a lot of volunteers, but the Southeast was a great place. So if you want to be successful in the other places, you have got to get your research introduced by the right group of people. I'm talking churches, I'm talking sororities, I'm talking fraternities, I'm talking about the Black Bar Association, all the Black organizations, NAACP, Urban League, you got to get the right person to stamp your research. As a patient, I work with researchers at Lonsville. I'm what is called a research advocate. What that means is that in plain language, when they want to do some research, I read it and if it makes sense to me, I talk. And if it doesn't, I say, you've got too many big words in here. Nobody knows what you're talking about. I don't know, that gross stuff, that tumor stuff, nobody knows what you're talking about. So I'm experienced in doing plain language. But my question to you, is plain language enough? Is it enough? It's not enough. Just because I can read what you said doesn't mean that I'm going to do it. I suggest, this is my personal, here we go. Jules and our genes research, my little crazy thought. This is my thought. You need to treat this research sort of like the cigarette companies and start hitting them young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm talking about, and most of the schools, like I work part time with schools that only go to fifth grade, they have no help. Them. But you need to put together fun children type information about health about research, about basic things about health, and get it into the school system at whatever grade level you can go back further than high school. Because it's our children that say to our parents, you shouldn't be smoking. 
I learned in school, you, it's the children who are advocating for help with because they're learning them. So you need to come back down into high school, maybe into grade six, seven, and eight. But you got to get the word out about you being medical. These kids, the good readers, you got good students in math. They don't even know they could be doctors. They don't even know they could be researchers. They don't even know that. And there are a lot of good students in these schools. But if you come in and start introducing um, de dentistry, all the medical medicine that you study at UB, the women's health, the researching, you could, you got to start recruiting like a few of companies. You got to make cartoons, you got to hit them young. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm hearing that. Yeah. Black people, get y'all back here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I think that I've spoken enough um, 10 minutes, but um, I think I kind of covered me because most of us are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veronica. We we need to be listening. I think everybody is listening. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Melanie Green, who's professor and chair of the Department of Communication in the College of Arts and Sciences. She studies the persuasive power of narratives in health communication and social issues. In fact, I did a lot of Zoom meetings about the uh, COVID vaccine, and uh, I probably could take some of this advice. I talked about a lot of data, I think, uh, in, in retrospect, and, and maybe maybe stories uh, mixed in would, would have helped. So her clinical and research effort, uh, uh, sorry, she's edited two books uh, and has published uh, uh, numerous articles in leading psychology, communication, and interdisciplinary journals. So it's a great to welcome Dr. Green. Melanie. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, and, you know, just because we talk about stories, data is great too. not trying to exclude any of that for sure. Um, so to start us off, one of the questions that sort of motivates my research program is the question of what do stories do? And I think this quote is a beautiful answer to that question. So Jens Eder in the introduction to one of his books said they make children go to sleep and soldiers go to war. And the thing I like about that is that I think it captures two really important elements of stories and storytelling. So one is that stories tend to be really simple, right? Kind of this plain language that we've been talking about all afternoon. So even children can understand them. But just because they're simple doesn't mean that they don't have an impact. Right, So they can motivate, in this case, soldiers going to war, but really major life decisions, big behaviors can be motivated by stories. And I've been using the word stories for a minute or two now. Um, I haven't seen anyone in the audience kind of squinting their eyes and saying, what is she talking about up there? Right, I think we all have a fairly intuitive understanding of what stories are, but just to give you a little bit more of a formal definition here. So when we talk about narratives or stories versus non-narratives, one of the big distinctions is that stories are something really that tell about somebody's experience. So it gives you information, but it's about what happened to someone. Whereas other kinds of information, we're just giving you that data or that, that information. And so typically narratives have characters. So they're about someone or someone or you know, something, have animated characters as well. They have temporality, which is not a plain language word, but let me translate it into something simple. That means it talks about events that happen over time. So this happened and then that happened. And then causality. So those events are linked in a cause and effect kind of sequence. This happened because this other thing happened. And that's often how stories convey their messages. They help us understand these causes and effects. Okay. And one of the fun things about stories and narratives is that there's such a wide diversity of them. There's lots of different types of narratives and there's lots of ways to use narratives in our communications. 
So one of the really most fundamental and basic kind of narratives are just two people talking to each other, right? Sharing the story of what happened to each other. So that could be among support groups, among friends, among patients and providers. Um, and it can go into more elaborate kinds of things. So in our research, we've used things like comic books when we were trying to reach middle school audiences and live theater because we happen to have a great collaboration with a playwright who was interested in domestic violence issues, um, written kinds of stories, whole range of different things that we can do. And stories can help us overcome a variety of different health, or sorry, communication challenges that we might have. So I come sort of from a persuasion background, trying to get people to do things or, or change their minds. And so one challenge that we often have is getting people to just pay attention to what we're trying to say in the first place. So we live in a very crowded media environment. People are busy. They've got a lot going on. Uh, and so one of the things about stories is they draw people in. They're interesting and entertaining. Think about the entertainment in industry, multi-billion dollars. What do we do when we come home, right? We go to Netflix, we go to the movies. Uh, people seek these things out. So it can help draw people to us as opposed to like chasing after them with a pamphlet and going, please, please, you know, read this information that we want to give you. Um, second thing that we sometimes encounter as a communication challenge, particularly with health issues, is that people don't want to be told what to do. They're resisting our information. They feel like we're they're, they're, that we're restricting their freedom by trying to tell them what to do. And so stories can be kind of a way around that because they're a little bit distant. They're um, they're not threatening to people like, okay, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you the story of this other person. They had a similar situation. Here's what they did. Here's what happened and let people draw their conclusions. Additionally, sometimes people don't uh, care about a particular issue. And so stories can maybe bring it home to them and make it a little more personal. Here's why you should care about that, about this issue. So again, stories kind of help put that human face on things that could otherwise seem distant, seem abstract, that we wouldn't care about. And then finally, sometimes, you know, as, as our first speaker very beautifully demonstrated, um, sometimes things are complicated. And so stories can help, you know, in combination with plain language can help make some issues more accessible, right? Again, putting it in terms of people's experience as opposed to maybe the abstractions. And so stories can help show people what to do. There's a um, extremely well-established uh, theory from social psychology, which is my home discipline called social cognitive theory, um, that shows that we learn a lot from stories. We learn about what's good, what's bad, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Uh, this picture of the clown up here is a reference to sort of a famous original study that, that he did where he was actually looking at media and violence. And it turns out if you, you show adults like hitting this, this Bobo doll with a hammer, then the kids go in and do it too. And obviously, you know, we're not all children, but there's a lot of cases where we do sort of, okay, we see something in the media, we hear something in a story, and we kind of follow along with that. And that can be used in a lot of good ways. So the other picture up here is uh, an example of an entertainment education effort. So this is a project that one of my colleagues is involved in, where they're, they're in, involved in the production of a television show that addresses a lot of issues of sexual health um, geared at Latino, um, Latino and Latina teens. And then stories also can work because they're able to engage people. So we call this being transported into a narrative world, this idea that when you encounter a really great story, you leave your regular world behind and step into that narrative world. So you know, when you're at the movie theater, when you're reading a great book or those types of things. And one of the nice things about that is that stories can bring together multiple mental systems. So we're cognitively engaged, we're thinking about it, it pulls in our emotions, which are a really key way of helping to motivate people to behavior, and it forms mental images in our mind. It gives us pictures of things, and that's another way that we help remember things. And so this kind of mindset where people are getting immersed in a message can help make them more open to considering other perspectives, uh, more open to other ideas. And there's a lot of evidence over the years that if we can get people to experience this kind of engagement, they're more likely to shift toward what the story is telling us. Okay, 
So a lot of stories out there, a lot of ways they can affect people. What are some ways that we can make stories effective when we're trying to communicate? Unfortunately, I cannot offer you an entirely foolproof cookbook or anything like that. Uh, if I could, I'd be making millions in Hollywood right now. Um, but I can offer you some suggestions based on research of things that good stories uh, generally have or should have. And one of the big ones that makes a story good is that it should be coherent. It should hold together. Things should flow logically from one step to the next. You shouldn't have you know, strange things coming in and make, making people go, what? Why did that person do that? Like, that wouldn't happen. That's sort of what you don't want. That's one of the, the big keys to good storytelling. But other things to think about are, you know, who are the characters in the story? Are they well-developed? Is there an emotional point or intensity to the story? Is it psychologically realistic? Are the people in your story acting like real people would act? production values, and of course, a big one is cultural appropriateness. What audience are you trying to reach? And does that story resonate with what they care about, with what their values and, and history is? And one of the, I think, nicer encouraging things about the research into what makes stories effective is that there's, it seems to be that there's a lot of different ways to make stories effective. I just showed you a long list on the previous slide, but you don't necessarily have to check all of those boxes. As long as you have some things that are good and you don't have something that's making people think, oh, what are you talking about? Then the stories often tend to be effective. And one thing to think about when you're thinking about using stories in health communication is it can be really helpful to find entry points to help people connect with that story, some point of similarity with their own lives. And just to give you a quick example, um, those entry points are not always the obvious ones. So this picture here is from uh, a, a health game that a group um, of researchers and I developed a number of years ago. And the point of the game was to, to try to raise awareness about heart attack symptoms and get people to uh, be able to recognize them so they would seek treatment more quickly. And in the process of developing this game, we created a variety of different characters to try to match the demographics of our audience. So we had the, the white woman and the African-American man and the Hispanic man, you know, these kinds of things, um, thinking that that would be something that would help people connect and identify with those characters. Not quite what happened. What happened was there was one character in this story, a guy named Big Joe. Big Joe ran the local pizza shop. Big Joe was having chest pain. He was having shortness of breath, but he did not want to go to the hospital because it was about to be the lunch rush at his pizza shop, and he didn't want to let his customers down. He needed to be there for his neighborhood and his people, okay? Everyone loved Big Joe. They didn't care that much about the other characters, but this character, they said, that reminds me of my dad. That reminds me of my grandpa. I know somebody like this. So, you know, the fact that maybe he wasn't the same race, these kinds of things didn't matter because the connection was to those values, the kind of person he was. So those are the kind of things that can make connections. And if you're using more uh, formal stories, like these kinds of stories, super helpful to do what we call formative research, but basically test it out with people from the audience that you're trying to reach. You know, don't make guesses, don't assume that your research team knows what's best, involve the community. And then a couple benefits and cautions from possibly using stories. One is that a single story can be pretty impactful, all right? but this can be good or bad. So a uh, personal story was a um, few years ago, I had to go in for some surgery, sat down with my doctor. She's telling me all about it, going through the risks and so on. And she explained that, you know, most people in a surgery have great outcomes. It's, it's not that risky, but she could tell sitting there in her office that I was still pretty nervous. And so she said to me, she said, Melanie, about a month ago, I had an 82-year-old woman in here, same procedure on her. Two weeks later, she walked into my office doing great, okay? That one story, more than all the numbers, 
helped put my mind at ease, right? I felt a lot better about it. Okay, well, 82 year old can do it. All right, I'll, I'll probably be okay too. So that was good in that case. But in other cases, what if the surgery had been more risky? What if it had been a story from, you know, some website that was not reliable? Um, if the story is not representative, people still often overgeneralize from that too. So we have to be careful. Uh, this little graph that you probably can't read on here was a study that we did where we had people choose between different medical treatments. And one of the things that we found is that if there was some kind of irrelevant similarity between the initial information that, uh, that they got in a story and the person that they were trying to decide the medical treatment for, they were more likely to choose the treatment that resembled uh, the one that the person had an irrelevant similarity to. I'm sure that makes no sense. Basically, what they were what they did is they said, oh, this patient has the same hobby as this other patient, so I'm going to recommend this treatment even though the kind of hobby that they had didn't have anything to do with the efficacy of the treatment. So they were sort of easily swayed by these, these trivial details. These were not medical professionals, lay people, but um, still kind of an issue that people can take away the wrong things from stories. Um, another quick research example is that obviously not all stories are created equal. Different stories can have different effects. And so one of the uh, studies that we did recently was looking at the use of stories to encourage COVID-19 vaccination. And here we were looking at a population of African-Americans who had not yet been vaccinated. And we gave them one of two different stories or an informational message. And in one of the stories, we taught the, the narrator of the story talked about their own journey of coming to decide to get the vaccine, right? So in this case, the, the speaker in the story was an African-American doctor. They talked about, hey, I had distrust of the medical system too. You know, we obviously know the, the history here, but here's how I did the research here. Here's how I decided to get vaccinated. The other story just said, hey, vaccine's good. I decided to get it. And the informational message was, was essentially the CDC message. And what we found was that the self-persuasion story was better. So helping show that journey was better uh, than just this, the vaccination story, but it wasn't better than an informational message. And so different types of stories can give you different effects, but sometimes people just need information. I mean, we did this relatively late in the pandemic. And so we thought that um, you know, people had all the information already, but clearly that wasn't the case for everybody because giving them that information increased their willingness. I will mention this last thing really quickly because I see that I'm short on time. Um, but one of the other things that stories can do is they can help create connections with people. So sometimes medical professionals can come off as, hey, I know you're really smart, but I don't know you care about me. And at least some initial research suggests that if somebody tells a story, that creates feelings of trust, feelings of warmth, liking, and can help build those bonds between uh, people that are giving the message and receiving a message. So stories can be useful, but be sure to use them wisely. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Melanie. That was great. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Dr. Lise Kaylor. Uh, who's a transplant surgeon and clinical professor of surgery. She's also uh, program director of the kidney and pancreas transplantation program and chief of the division of transplant surgery in the department of surgery in the school of medicine. Her clinical and research efforts have focused on helping people with end stage kidney disease uh, get kidney transplants, especially those who have difficulty accessing healthcare, which is typically people of color, people of low literacy, and low socioeconomic status. And with funding from HRSA and, a, and an R01 grant from NIH, she and her team have developed and tested these very innovative uh, an, animated-based educational outreach interventions, and importantly, have tested them uh, and which elements of them work and don't work and so forth, focused on live donor kidney transplantation. So Lise, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, I've, I've been in practice for 23 years now. And um, during that time, interestingly, there's been a, a variety of educational interventions produced. Um, some of them very effective, even doubling the rate of kidney transplantation. Um, but none of them could I introduce into my practice with full fidelity. We just didn't have the time. And so I said, uh, five years ago, I was at a place in my career where I thought I'll try something different um, and started making animated videos. I thought I'm the expert on this topic. I should easily be able to make short videos about these subjects. Uh, but I quickly realized that my expertise was a handicap. <laughs> um, and that if I was going to be successful, I would have to try to understand what's going on in my patients' minds and use their words to speak to them. Um, I came here in 2015, um, and my main goal was to help patients get transplanted as soon as possible, which means navigating this multi-step process. So I started meeting with providers at each step and introducing efficiencies into the system. We were successful in many ways, but a big problem was that confused patients poorly navigate health systems. And the providers were hardworking, but they were busy. They didn't have time to do more education than they were already doing. So I knew whatever I made, it would have to be standalone for patients to access on their own and come to providers more empowered to um, have meaningful conversations. I also asked patients what they thought of the education that they had received. I love this one about um, watching a DVD in the lobby. The patient said, give me my prices right. <laughs> um, clearly a big theme is that the, the education lacked appeal. So the type of education that I thought about that could be standalone and appealing um, was animated video. And I wasn't a big video watcher. Uh, so I thought about a video from my childhood. <laughs> I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. Uh, but it turns out this kind of video has too much motion for, for anim to be educational. Um, but there is a strong theoretical basis for animation as a powerful instructional medium. Uh, so I put together a video development process and um, it incorporated learning theories. Uh, it included input from patients, kidney patients, kidney donors, caregivers, as well as experts and implementers, people like me, uh, doctors, and also a um, opportunistic lay person because uh, none of the experts could speak conversationally. I kind of think like plain language is harder or easier for us to get to, maybe using simple words and stuff, but conversation, we are bad at. And even though like I might say, oh, I need a ride to the airport. But when I started doing this, I would say, you need transportation to the airport. Like, why couldn't I just speak conversationally? <laughs> Um, so this started with some seed funding from my hospital and the university, and then we got a HRSA grant to develop a whole curriculum that we feasibility tested, and then that led to um, an NIH grant where it's the interventions in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and we have now 26 videos, um, each two minutes long, focused on the whole trajectory. Half of them are directed towards recipients and half towards donors, since having a living donor is the best option, it's the highest quality kidney, results in the longest uh, survival of the kidney, and, you can, and it happens faster. But when I finished the curriculum, I was a little concerned um, that it wasn't balanced enough. Um, I had done a video on common issues after kidney donation, which, uh, covered like pain and bloating, but not um, serious uh, complications. Instead, I had said, uh, donating a kidney may have some complications and something, something, something. 
before you decide to donate. We will go over these with you before you decide to donate. What I really wanted to do was a video on, you know, five complications that were unlikely but important before making a decision. But I, did, I was afraid of confusing people or even worse, um, having my messages misinterpreted. So, uh, but I had some extra money from the HRSA grant. So I decided uh, I'm gonna make this video and if it doesn't work, I just won't include it in the curriculum. Uh, and so it's uh, 439 words long, which is 3.25 minutes. I'm gonna tell you a, a little bit about how the patients helped me make it and then show you a portion of it. Um, so we always start with a problem. You want to donate a kidney, but you're not sure how safe it is. Uh, People could stop watching a video at any time. So you always want the last word to be something that is sort of close to the message. And then we, the next thing you should say is a preview to the ending. Um, like the kidney donation surgery has an excellent safety record. Again, if they stop the video at this time, they get the gist of the intended meaning. Then I described each video and um, each complication in chronological order and showed it, showed the earliest prototype to my patients. Um, and, and I only showed it to patients who had helped me with the previous video, so they had context. And they said, it's not as positive as the previous videos. And I was like, how am I gonna make a complication video as positive? <laughs> but then I backed up and I said, okay, where does this story starts with the careful evaluation we do? So I introduced, the careful evaluation. This is because donors are thoroughly tested for kidney function, heart and lung health, and blood pressure, among other things. The results are carefully reviewed by a team of experts, and to ensure donor safety, only those that are healthy enough are able to donate. And this actually meets a third tenet of video making, which is a gentle opening and introducing obvious, simple concepts that give people self efficacy in being able to learn. Um, the concepts that are going to be introduced. So uh, then I finally had to start talking about a complication. Um, most donation surgeries are done laparoscopically through small incisions with miniature instruments, which shortens the healing time. We're always prepared to switch to an open surgical method if we feel that's best for you, that's what's best for you and the kidney. An open method means a bigger incision and a little longer healing time. One thing that um, patients really want to know is why. Why are we doing things? And if you don't tell them why or their questions will stack up and it'll be hard for them to learn the next concept. Um, also, I, I originally was not going to introduce any jargon, but uh, if you explain the jargon, it can be helpful because it gives them an insight into, um, or they feel they're getting more insight into the subject. But also, it's if it's a word that is going to frequently be used by their providers, it can be helpful. Uh, so here's the last one before I show you the video. Uh, in the unlikely event of surgical bleeding, a blood transfusion may be needed, and we'll have your blood type standing by just in case. So when um, at first I had the unlikely event entered in the last part of the sentence. And the patient said, no, start with that. And I think it's because knowing the frequency of the event helped to reduce their fear so that they could listen to what I was saying instead of worrying the whole time, how frequent is this? Um, another thing is the script is incredibly important. There's no amount of imagery that's going to overcome a bad script. And the other important thing is the narrator. A narrator has to pause after each concept, speak slowly, and inflect. Monotone, fast-speaking people can ruin a video. Um, so, oh yeah, I, I then decided to test this video, of course. Um, it did increase knowledge by 23%. Of those that agreed to, I'm worried about possible complications of kidney donation surgery, the percentage was low and it stayed low. Um, despite having learned more about it, and they, um, those that agreed to living kidney donation as a safe procedure actually increased from something like 89% to 95%. It wasn't statistically significant, but it increased a little bit. 
All right, let's see if we can make. Donation surgery has an excellent safety record. This is because donors are thoroughly tested for kidney function, heart and lung health, and blood pressure, among other things. The results are carefully reviewed by a team of experts, and to ensure donor safety, only those that are healthy enough are able to donate. Most donation surgeries are done laparoscopically through small incisions with miniature instruments, which shortens the healing time. We are always prepared to switch to an open surgical method if we feel that that's what's best for you and the kidney. An open method means a bigger incision and a little longer healing time. In the unlikely event of surgical bleeding, a blood transfusion may be needed and we'll have your blood type standing by just in case. Although it's rare, some donors get blood clots in their veins. We take steps to prevent this. We'll give you compression socks and a blood thinner to help with circulation. Walking helps prevent blood clots, too. You'll be ready to get up and move the day after surgery. If you get a blood clot, we will take care of it by giving you a blood thinner pill to take at home for three to six months. <clears throat> Developing a hernia in the incision area is uncommon. If you get a hernia, you might feel a bulge under your skin. A hernia happens when the internal incision doesn't heal right. To prevent a hernia, you should avoid lifting anything heavier than 10 pounds for a month. And we will give you stool softeners to keep you from straining. If you happen to get a hernia, it can be repaired with surgery. If you're wondering how complications are paid for, the recipient's insurance pays for early complications. And if the recipient has Medicare, donor-related complications are covered for the rest of your life. Our financial coordinator is here to help you before and after surgery. The team will ensure that you've been thoroughly tested and are in the best of health before surgery so that complications are unlikely. All surgeries carry the risk of death but it's extremely rare in kidney donation. We are dedicated to the safety of our donors and recipients, and we are here for you before, during, and after your donation. Since 1954, over 150,000 people in the U.S. have donated a kidney, and most say they would do it again if they could. For more information, visit transplantinfo.com or give your local center a call. Thank you, Lise. That's terrific work. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Junjun Zhang, who's a SUNY Empire Innovation Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, one reason I love this panel is look at the range of expertise and disciplines and so forth. Uh, it is wonderful. Uh, Dr. Zhang is one of the leaders who was recently awarded the $20 million uh, grant from NSF to establish the AI Institute for Exceptional Education to create AI technologies to help children with speech and language difficulties. Very uh, innovative stuff. He's an expert in AI and is beginning to apply these tools to the study of health literacy. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Jin Jun. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hey, good afternoon. Yeah, and uh, yeah. thank you. And uh, by the way, just disclaimer, okay, this title was given by Tim. Actually, I didn't even know this title, but I like to take the title. <laughs> Does AI have a role in health literacy? I think that's a good title, actually. And uh, I know a lot of people know about AI, but uh, I guess how many people know about AI? Please raise your hands. Almost everyone, right? I only know the movie. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point, right? Now, everyone seems like to know about AI, but uh, everyone's understanding of AI is different. For me, for a computer scientist, I know what AI has been through, right? From the early days, the hype of the AI to the crash of the AI, called the 
AI winter, right? And actually a few years ago, I was at IBM before I joined the UB. And I literally, I can tell you a story about how the AI translated in, in IBM's kind of uh, company. But now suddenly the AI is back again. Now everyone knows about the AI. So now if I ask you about what do you know about AI? Everyone has his own connections. I mean, that's somewhat early speakers mentioned, right? I think this days, if you hear the news, you read the news, New York Times news about the recent AI, I think what is the one word you would think about AI? Anyone? Chat GPT. Yes. <laughs> Chat GPT. Yes. <laughs> no worries. I will show you what it is. Okay, because this title is given by Tim, so I said, okay, let me ask it, Chat GPT what it is. <laughs> what is it? No. This is what a Chat GPT. I said, okay, Chat GPT, right? What is the health literacy? That's Chat GPT's answer, right? I know it's a long, but I'm highlight a few keywords which are surprising me. So okay, health literacy, right? Not only trying to help individuals to ability to obtain, understand, and apply the health information services to do whatever, blah, 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 right? Finally, it's the ability to critically evaluate information and make appropriate health decisions. It sounds very interesting. Hey, is this correct or not? As a computer scientist, I want to check. So I went to CDC to search, Google search, right? Hey, what is the health literacy? That's a long definition, you know? But an interesting point is surprising to see how powerful ChatGPT is. If I read this whole document, you will realize, actually this whole definition of health literacy has changed recently, right? From the early versions to the newer versions. In the newer version, they, they emphasize two things, right? Not only about informing the patient, but also the patients to apply or use that information. And the second is about the, Caregivers, right? Operational health, uh, operational health um, literacy is kind of agrees and how to help you. So as you can see here, right, makes appropriate health decisions. Somehow, even the chat GPT knows the change of this definition and rephrase in a way very much appropriate for this definition. That's very powerful. So now, why I'm here? So now this is kind of why I actually was invited to come to here because of thanks to Teresa and Andy. Actually, through our conversation early, they gave me this task. They said, hey, we need to have this play English, right, for the patients. So they give me a lot of data. One of the data is this pamphlet, right? This is kind of, a, hey, if you want to do the kind of study, as you mentioned, you know, to recruit the patient, this is a nicotine kind of for the uh, recruiting. It's one of the studies, right? You prepare this pamphlet and to, to, to give it to different patients, hey, can you please help us? As you can see, these are two pages, okay? Pa pamphlet. I hope I can use some laser pointer here. The bottom, one. the bottom one. Okay, here, thank you. So this is kind of pamphlet, two pages, right? With some facts, and of course, some of the numbers, but with some of other things here, right? And if I want to, okay, can I make this to be more informative? What I did is, I take the snippets of the information based on what I would read as a pamphlet, right? Structurally. So I ask ChatGPT again. Okay, I said, ChatGPT, please, right? Can you please help with the assessment of this uh, health literacy level for the following documents? Because the ChatGPT right now is only able to read language. So that's something I have to use, only use the text. But the newer version seems like to be able to handle the pictures too. But this is only happened yesterday. So now I copy paste, almost copy paste, right? But I have to reorganize the documents because there's some of irrelevant information. So I copy paste this document, right? Some of the facts, right? And what is the mean study and what is the MCI and what is why you use this nicotine and, uh, and how you can be eligible and uh, is your memory and some of the questions and how do you want to be involved? I give the whole paragraphs. Please tell me how good this is in terms of health literacy. That's what the charity, charity GP comes back to me, right? So like, this document appears to read in a relatively high level of health literacy. It means it's difficult, a little bit difficult to understand. 
But overall, the structure is correct, and you have used the right vocabularies, et cetera, et cetera. So it's okay. This is ChatGPT's answer. That I says, okay, that's great, because that's a Teresa's task for me. Can you please make it the plain language, lower the levels? I said, please, I, I want to do the easy work. So ChatGPT, please help me, <laughs> right? Can you help me to rewrite the above document and improve the health literacy? Right, so that again. Oh. oh, I think there's some copy paste um, error. I, basically, what I'm saying, okay, please help me to rewrite, okay? And then the, this is what Charlie Tibi said. This is a revised version of this document, and blah blah blah. You say, like, hmm, what does that mean? Right, and uh, looks like it's almost a similar, maybe a little bit better. But I, I read it. Okay, trust me. It is factually correct. Then I said, okay, no, this is not just, just pretty much kind of copy paste as me as what, what I just did. I want you to do something more. I said, can you please rewrite it again? So that I'm not given the prompt, right? Very explicitly. I want a fifth grade students able to understand. Can you please rewrite it? Boom, you go, here you go, right? This is a rewrite. You can see much shorter, right? And then rewrite it. And you read it, I was like, beautifully done. Yeah. Right? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Then I said, like, hmm, because of a computer scientist, this is not enough, right? I won't have some quantification, right? I won't have assessment. So I said, okay, now you have given me this document. Can you please give me a number, a score, right? A grade. Tell me this document, right? And uh, what does the score look like if it is such a score? And actually, I didn't know this one. Try to actually find out for me. Saying, hey, there's a score called the test of functional health literacy in adults. This is even a score. And somehow they applied it as a score to this document. They just rewrite, rewritten, right? For both the, the first version and the second version. Now he says, for the first version of a rewrite or the original version, right? It is about a 60 to 70 out of 100 score. And the, the rewritten one is about 80 to 90 out of 100. So which means this is a higher level of healthy literacy. So that's kind of interesting, right? So now the, the chat chip is able to even assess the scores for the documents they've written. That's great. So I said, okay, okay, wow. Because of the first task I did is copy paste, not only copy paste, I have to make sure that okay, some of the irrelevant information gets removed to ask chat GPT. If I want to automate the process, right? Which means I want to be even simpler, which means give me any documents. I don't look at it. Copy, paste, ask ChatGDB. Copy, paste, ask ChatGDB. That's what I, want, I would like to do. But that's what I did at this time. Take the same document, the same pamphlet, right? Now just copy, paste, ask ChatGDB, rewrite it. So now you can see some of the formatting is wrong, right? You can see some of this uh, in the, in the middle of the have some of the uh, calling numbers, which is if you read, if you read it in, the, in, uh, in, in English, you'll find this information is kind of out of the place. But anyway, ask GDP, can you please rewrite it? Yes, it will. And somehow it's very robust as well. It's able to remove those kind of irrelevant information and rewrite this document in a very much readable format. Again, I can ask this one. Can you please rewrite this one? For the fourth, fifth grade again, beautifully done, right? Again, we just rewrite. This version, by the way, is different from the first version, and it's able to rewrite the documents, and uh, for so that the fifth grade students seem to be able to understand as well. Now, given these two documents, right? I said, okay, can you please give me this assessment score, right? And uh, convert the level into a score that is. Uh, basically giving me a score. Now suddenly this gives me a different answer. Now this is like, oh, I'm an AI language model. I cannot give you a definite score, right? But anyway, since you ask, looks like, they give me this assessment of a seven to ninth grade of reading levels. The other one is uh, after rewriting, it's about the fourth to the fifth grade levels. So, which means the rewriting did help, right? But, since I have said, okay, you have a score, right? 
don't give me this like a very vague numbers. I wanted the precise scores. So I said, can you please, right? Use the score you just told me. Give me a score numbers. Now it's coming back a different score numbers. It's a 7 to 85 for the first version and another version, which is a different score. Unfortunately, it's getting blocked. But the, trust me, what I try to say is, <laughs> what they realize is okay, on the surface, strategy seems very powerful, right? Able to write the documents beautifully. But what I just did is an experiment, right? With two different documents, same kind of questions. And the strategy give you different answers. In, if you only look at the language itself, it seems like, okay, both versions look okay. But if you want to quantify it, because we try to explain things, you'll realize there's an inconsistency in terms of the explanation, in terms of the assessment level, the score, right? Even the same scores, you can see different times you, I ask the same questions, they give me different scores. So this, which means this is kind of the AI challenges. Even though the AI can do some very powerful things, there's some catches. How do you make sure your answer is consistent? When you communicate to the patient, you don't want to come to hear the doctor tell you one thing today, the next day the doctor comes back to tell you, tell you a different story, right? The consistency and explainability. Why do you think this is readable now, right? You want to explain your decisions. You're explaining the way you reach this kind of current uh, uh, version of the writing and the reproducibility. So there's many ways the AI still need to kind of overcome in order for this to be really uh, uh, usable oh, at the some levels, you know, which means you cannot blindly use it, maybe use it with some cautions. The, right yes, get you the right directions. You still need to have some humans in the loop, <laughs> right? So now let me move on to the second part of my talk, right? And we all know for the communication, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So now the question is again, what about a 3D model? Would that be even more valuable? Right? I think that's what we have in the medical domains, right? Not only pictures. We have 3D images, pictures, right? This is 3D MRI images. And for a lot of patients, you know, in order for you to understand what's happening in the body, inside of the body, you do the 3D scan images, right? This is kind of the 3D imaging scans for the different sector, uh, kind of sections, right? Uh, 3D images with the different frame by frame. And that's how the doctors understand a certain disease, right? And they try to use this to, you know, try to use this information to make some uh, decisions. But think of this, this is 3D information. Since this is, uh, we want the 3D model is important. What happens if we put the 3D models, not only the three images as shown here, right? But we put the 3D models into some augmented reality and virtual reality. So you can really see it. Actually, I have an app I can show you later if you're interested in. So now I can take that information, the 3D image, 3D kind of static images, right? As you show here, this is an augmented reality images. If somehow we are able to take that static image that you typically saw, right? I can reconstruct this 3D models and put in the hands of the patient. And then you can explain to the patient, the images that you only doctor can understand suddenly become some 3D models. You can see here, right? This is the same images, but not reconstructed and in the augmented reality. And you can see this is a kind of a part of the cancer, right? Now it's moving up. You can see, you can zoom in. This is how the tumor looks like, right? So this is the power of the imaging. Now it's not only imaging, it's a 3D imaging. Not only 3D imaging, it's a 3D imaging in the AR augmented reality, virtual reality. Unfortunately, all of this, has to be done manually these days. So my inspiration is think, imagine together, right? If we are able to take the current medical imaging data, able to automatically use AI to construct the 3D models in the hands of patient. So now when you try to communicate with the patient, you can use this as 3D models to explain what's happening inside of your body. Think of the power, right? So my message is let the AI to produce AR, AR or VR type of content for medical applications to improve the health literacy automatically. So that's kind of my answer to Tim's question. 
Does AI have a role in health literacy? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Boy, that is five awesome perspectives, I have to tell you, on health literacy. Let's give the panel another one. Just great. So uh, the panel is open for questions and comments and, and so forth. Uh, the audience, the panel can talk to each other. I have questions, but let's open up for the audience and the panel. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Philip Lunay. I'm one of the... Uh, I'm one of the general surgery residents and currently one of the ECRIP fellows working with uh, Dr. Noyes and Dr. Manetti. So my question is directed to you, Kelly, uh, primarily, but I'd love to hear other thoughts as well. So I think anybody who sees patients has had an experience like the one you shared, where a patient comes in, they saw something scary, complicated, confusing in their chart. Uh, in the EMR, we as clinicians are really using heuristics, right? We're using shorthand, and the intention is mostly to communicate with each other. The radiologist could have written out the description in plain language, but it, as you demonstrated, really would have taken him or her longer. It would have taken the orthopedic surgeon, primary care physician, et cetera, longer to read it as well. So ultimately, now we have patients who have access to the EMR, which really presents a unique situation. And we have some big picture questions to think about, right? So ultimately, who is the EMR for? What is its purpose? And ultimately, should we be using plain language in patients' charts? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I uh, I like being able to explore um, the internet. Uh, when I got my first MRI, they gave me the disc, and so I took it home and put it in the computer. And went to the directory to see if I could find if there was a program already on the DVD or if it was something that like uh, professionals would use. But, so I'm different. Um, and I did figure out how to open up the MRI and look at all the scans, and I'm like, oh, let me look what it has. Like, what does a healthy spine look like? Like, I don't know. Like, people go to school for this, but I enjoy it. And so I think everything is not for everybody. I think we have to um, find ways to meet people where they are, but not make things so complicated that it, it um, but not make things so complicated. I don't know what that line is. Um, from a, I think from a research standpoint, you have more time. You can talk, you can have focus groups, you can bring the community together. Uh, but when it comes to you know being in a, a physician setting, you know you've got the twenty minutes to be able to do all the things. But we got to figure it out, right? Like we, we just have to figure out a way to to do it so that um, you don't have to write a whole paragraph. And it's not teaching people Latin. I'm guessing that everyone is Latin. I don't know. But it, it, it's not necessarily that either. Like, everyone's not meant to, to do that. Um, so there, there is a line. I think um, if, like, long term, especially like from an equity perspective, if we begin to monetize health uh, versus illness, and there's, you know, we're, we're in that process now. Um, that would be a step in the right direction because things like care coordinators and um, having community health workers in the office to be able to have those extended conversations, um, raising up more peers that have been through whatever the thing is to be able to not give medical advice, but to, to be there for someone. So I think in the long run, it is cheaper to be able to do those things than um, focus on how do we get doctors more time in the room to spend with patients. Not saying that they shouldn't, but I think there are pieces missing from our system that would assist us in really meeting people where they are. Um, oh, yeah, fine. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. I, you know, I think I think a lot about what is the intended message. And uh, with patient portal, it's sort of like the whole name large is dumped in there and you can go check it out. And, you know, it would be better. It, there's a lot of work to be done in, in every way. Now, I mean, even posters on the wall, um, handouts that we have to patients, 
Is it really helping them? Is it really delivering the intended message? Are they receiving the message in a way that would empower them the most? Um, or are they just looking at it and confused? So I, I do think that um, it would be better if the patient portal could be helpful and, you know, some way of allowing somebody to use it in a meaningful way. But there, we can't spend so much time reinterpreting everything we do. And even if we try, there's some element of doctors synthesizing the data and developing a treatment plan that we are depend, they depend on us for that. And it's not going to be that the patient's going to be able to figure out from all the little reinterpretations what the plan is, but there's something that they should be able to figure out and they should get a message and that should help empower them in their health journey. So. I just I just think that all messages um, should include uh, multiple uh, ways that a person understands. So words, uh, pictures, Voices. Um, I think that that is as long as you're doing that, because even though it's at fifth grade level, your patient might be third grade. So having something that they can listen to is going to be very important. Plan. Yeah, and just I mean, thinking of the last talk, this really seems like an area where technology can help a lot. Like if the patient record could be linked to. A you know, website that does have that, that plain language information. I mean, this, this doesn't have to be a burden that falls on the primary care, on the clinicians, like their solution. Well, that's that. No, not that. <laughs> yeah, not that. Yeah, I mean, these presentations were fascinating. And I'm going to ask a question that any of you, I think, can answer. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of the elements that you show, Jinjun, are elements of informed consent. And so regarding chat GPT, which seems very powerful, I know teachers worry about this and so forth, but could you, I mean, could this be applied to ICS, to informed consent forms, to simplify the language, you know, which still are problematic. The other thought I had is, I don't know how much effort you had to put into making these animations, but they've become pretty popular. New England Journal of Medicine puts out these animated two to three minute videos to explain research. I think mostly the doctors don't specialize in that particular area and maybe for the lay audience too. Um, they, I think some would call deeper dives. Uh, I have some experience with them because they, 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 they put one of my studies on these animated videos. I thought it was fantastic. But they have a staff, they have resources to do this. But could ChatGPT actually take, I've, only, I've never played with it. Can it go beyond text at this point and create an animated video? Can you actually do that? Uh, how much effort do you have to put into the, getting those videos put together with artists? Can this be automated? Uh, it, was, it was a huge amount of effort. Yeah. Can, can, can ChatGPT do that? Say, I want this story told. This is the text. I want people talking to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the engineer. <laughs> I agree with that. Right now, I am not. Right? But even the chat GPT, right, is only able to handle the languages. Oh. Right? The one with the images is coming. The chat GPT, not GPT-4, you know, is coming and uh, can handle some of the images. But uh, if you try to do what it's kind of cool. Now, this is uh, uh, not a chat GPT, because it gives too much time to chat GPT. It's a general AI, that's it, right? So AI has not had this but uh, AI can automatic content generation. Now you see some of the value too to, to generate images. You can give a text, right? Say, hey, give me a images of a patient, a doctor talk to a patient. Boom, you'll get an image. It's not a search image, it's generated images. Right? So this AI is not getting more and more powerful, it's able to generate new content. So now the next question is how do you really sequence? Or integrate different content in a coherent way, right? That's kind of one of the challenges I mentioned about how do you make this consistent, right? And reproducible. That is still a bigger challenge for AI. That's something AI still uh, has a lot of research to do. So let me, yes, can other be? 
But do I believe in the future should we do that? Yes. I think AI is not going to re re replace humans. In particular, it's about improve the productivity, right? Some of the effort, you know, it's too labor intensive. I think that should be done by AI. So we can focus on more creative kind of a task. I think that's the future. I mean, maybe it could create the first script from which you could develop. Yes. But, I, you know, there are so many little, the, the, the other thing is, we don't really think about that, this, but humans have emotions. <laughs> and every word you use can create an emotion in somebody. And like there were times when I realized I'm using the word disease too much. And that's why we say kidney and lung health. Whereas as doctors, we don't talk that way. We say kidney disease. But um, those little things make a difference. And the thing I discovered is like the power of each word and how it's organized. And I mean, sometimes I I I revise scripts throughout the video making process. I mean, keep finding better ways of saying things and um, really getting at the meaning that you are intending. And um, yeah, it's the uh, the writing the writing process. I, I I think health communication is extremely difficult. And it's it's hard to speak in a clear way. It's hard to you know talk to patients in a clear way. The making of the videos has completely changed the way that I talk to patients in my clinic. But you know it hasn't changed anybody else. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> because of the process that, that I've gone through. Um, but yeah, I think. Yeah, it's not just plain language. <laughs> Kelly, did you want to make a comment? Uh, oh, no, not specifically that question, just general. Okay. Do you want me to do that now? We'll take uh, one more question, if there is one. Oh, yes, please. And then, and then you. Uh -huh. Hi. So um, at the end, you just mentioned the communication is just not, it's not just about plant language, right? It's also about the culture relevance and also about how um, effective the emotional dimension is. So I know some of the panelists have touched on the issues. So I'm really interested in probably this question for the audience as well, because in Georgia, you are a health uh, profession. Um, so the language, because the play language only touch on the cognitive dimension of communication, right? So the cultural dimension is actually a lot more challenging. How can we make this information relevant to the people in front of you? Um, translating to their home language is one baby step. But how can we really get to the person? Really, you have to understand where they come from, what their life story. I mean, I love the, the story narrative based communication potential address the issues. So basically, I'm going to post this question to the audience as well as the panelists to think about the cultural context that people are dealing with. But right? it's not simply they are they come in just the brain. There's the other life story behind it. So that's where they are in your community. Point. Thank you. Kelly, you want to make one more comment and then we'll take a, a, a break. I did. Um, and yes, culture is so important, right? Yeah. Uh, whole other conversation, but I, I watched um, a lot of green TV on Netflix, and, and that at first, nothing, I mean, but English made sense, right? But I was missing some content, and it wasn't until I got to understand how the structure of the story is told, right? And, and so I really got to understand what was happening, right? So some of that is, you know, the, the time you spend doing it, 
But what I, I wanted to talk about real quickly was because you're researchers is to begin just aggregating your demographic data. Um, one of the things we did at the Office of Health Equity for our wellness survey is we just aggregated race data mm -hmm. and uh, gender, sexuality, and uh, uh, ethnicity. Um, Western New York and Buffalo, Erie County is different than the U.S. and different than the world. And so the best example I can give you is this aggregate, well, too, this aggregate in Hispanic, right? When we look at data, U.S. data, um, the Hispanic population is mostly Mexican. Uh, when you look at the makeup of Buffalo, the Hispanic population is mostly Puerto Rican. Those are two different places, right? Two different cultures. They may speak the same language, but someone from Mexico can say, that person's not Mexican. They might be Puerto Rican or maybe Dominican. I don't know, but they're not Mexican. So we need to look past our this, this upper level of, of data uh, collection. Um, the other thing we just aggregated was Asian. Um, most of the people in the world come from Asia, right? We only have one category for 60% of the population, right? So again, uh, an immigrant story, generalizing, you know, known as a monolith, and a refugee story, they're coming from different places. Right, different life places. Why do we put them all in the same group? So I, I urge you to do that. Um, also, when you're looking to expand uh, your uh, focus groups and your, your people that you talk to, please use more than the same five people, right? We are not a monolith, no group is a monolith. And so if you're using the same five churches, the same five synagogues, the same five corner stores, like the same five. Expand, right? That's a good place to start, but you will still have gaps. So I encourage you to do that. And finally, ECMT, years ago when I worked there, uh, used to do a seventh grade um, uh, hands on day at the science museum. They would get all of the laparoscopic equipment and all that stuff, take it to the science museum. They bring in melon and stuff. And so the kids would be able to use the it was the, the things that go inside to do stuff in surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and they, their job was to, to use them and to be able to pull out a seed. They could see the, the monitor. They, they got to see that they could be more than the five things that they're being taught that they can do. So yes, we have to engage them early and in creative ways. I think that's a fantastic way for you to be able to pour into the local community is to begin having things like that. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. And boy, thanks so much to the panel. That was just terrific. Uh, uh, let's give them one more. Uh, and I congratulate the speakers on staying pretty darn close to your time. You know, I think the questions could go.